Well, good day, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Typewriter video series. Look what I have here. I have another typewriter. Let's take a look at it. And I really like this brass plate down here. You can see the letters UTCO, which might give away the brand of typewriter to some of you guys. An Underwood Portable. How cool is that? So I got this typewriter at the Antique Specialty Mall here in Albuquerque about a week ago. And it was a pretty decent price. Uh, that particular store has a number of little rooms on one side of the store. Uh, and each one is a separate uh, exhibitor's booth. And I had peeked my head into this one room a couple weeks ago and really didn't look around all that careful. But this one, this typewriter was sitting up on an antique cabinet, a little bit higher than eye level. And... I finally paid attention and saw it and uh, immediately was drawn to it by its age and appearance. Uh, the paint job is a little rough. I mean, there's some, you know, worn paint along the front edge here. And the paint is kind of has a faded, discolored look in places. Not super uh, new, but, you know, when you consider, based on the serial number, that this machine was made in 1930. So... Uh, you would expect it to have a little bit of wear. All the decals appear to be okay. We'll show you the one up here. This Underwood one is in good shape, and the ones in the back also. Um, yeah, so I've never owned an Underwood of this particular model before. I had an Underwood Universal, but the Underwood Portable is a little bit different. It really kind of reminds me initially of the Corona 4, just from the age of it. But there are quite a few differences uh, between it and the Corona 4. And one of the most notable differences is, um, even though this is named a portable, um, it's really intended to be used inside or mounted to the bottom of the case. This one, there is a little bracket that attaches in the back to the case, and then there's two spring-loaded screws, one here and one here, that you have to unscrew to remove the the uh, typewriter from the base. And so it's really intended to be used on the base. So, and loosening the screws. Two little mounting screws. This lifts up and pulls forward. And then we can remove it from the base. And the base has this metal bracket here, and there's a metal tang on the base back of the typewriter that it fits into. Other than that, it's just a leather-covered piece of wood. The bottom of the typewriter, actually it has four feet, right? But it has these metal posts here and here, which really makes it kind of uncomfortable for sitting it down on a surface. You can do it, but um, it has to be a very smooth surface. Otherwise, the mechanics of the typewriter might hang up, like if you set it on a blanket or something soft. So you really, it kind of is kind of intended to be sat in its base or on a table. You, you really, typewriters of this vintage, you really shouldn't uh, use them on your lap just because you might get grease or whatever from the mechanism on your clothes. So, so it's not in super bad condition. Uh, you know, the paint job is a little mottled and discolored. And the most notable uh, thing about the condition is the left ribbon spool cover has some rust along here. Uh, but it's kind of charming in a way. Um, so the condition of the typewriter. I generally don't buy typewriters unless they work. I, have, I test them at the store or wherever I find them. And I was surprised to find out that everything in this typewriter worked well. Even the original ribbon still had a little bit of, of color left in it, uh, enough to get an idea of the imprint and how the printing quality was. And I was surprised to find out that this, the type alignment, the alignment of the letters was um, very even, and it was much better than what was on my old Corona 4 that I used to own, which even after paying hundreds of dollars to get it reconditioned, it the letters were never really quite straight. And that was one of the main reasons why I got, I sold the Corona 4 is just because I ended up using it more as a display typewriter than actually using it for, for writing. 
But this machine impresses me in a lot of ways. Uh, I think my initial impression is the build quality. I really think it's built a little more solidly than the Corona 4s were. Um, I certainly like these nickel rimmed keys, glass top keys. They're a little more striking in their appearance, I think, than the, uh, uh, the Coronas were. And um, I think just the feel of the machine it just feels better. So let's take a little tour of this, shall we? So one of the things that impresses me initially about the typewriter that makes it different from the Corona and others is the direction the ribbon spools turn. So they thread so that the uh, ribbon comes off the front side of the pack of the reel instead of the back of the reel. And so it has a little more severe of an angle coming in toward the vi ribbon vibrator. Um, it just it was a difference than, that I noted. Uh, it does have an automatic ribbon reversing system, which appears to be working fine on this typewriter. Um, one of the only issues I had with this machine initially was that the um, tops of the capital letters was being cut off. And I thought initially that that was some kind of a, an alignment issue uh, with the upper and lower case uh, positions. But then I, uh, on a hunch, I gave the ribbon some more slack and the problem goes away and as soon as you start typing enough to where the ribbon kind of tenses itself up more the problem would reoccur. So I knew the problem had something to do with the tension in the reels. And so what I did was uh, I pulled off the, ribbon the ribbons and this little, I have to reposition this, this little uh, bur uh, silver color nickel whatever stainless steel it's a disc with the ribbon spool shaft and the little pin um, there's a set screw underneath this dark mounting bracket and if you loosen that set screw there's a shaft with a gear on the bottom that drops out of the bottom of the machine that turns this it comes out real easy uh, but anyway once you do that uh, you can find that this um, piece right here didn't turn smoothly either one that was kind of really rough to turn and so to clean underneath there you actually have to remove the set screw completely uh, which means holding on to the head of the screw with a needle nose pliers while you loosen it otherwise it falls into the machine once it gets loose and then this piece right here pulls right off and I found there's a little kind of a brass ring uh, uh, that's pressed into this bracket here underneath and there's a little rim on the inside underneath this this round disc that rides on that kind of a metal on metal surface like a bearing and that was just really gunked up with old stuff and so cleaning that up uh, these spools ended up turning nice and freely and that fixed the problem with the tension on the on the ribbon and so I it it solved the problem of the uh, the top of the letters being cut off. So that was really about the only problem. The other thing I ran into was um, I wanted to take the platen out. It's quite hard, but I wanted to do a little bit of, you know, reconditioning it with alcohol. <clears throat> and um, the way you take the platen out is you take, uh, you loosen a set screw here and over here, and both knobs pull out, and then uh, you lift up the paper bale and you have to work the platen loose. On the left side here, there is a, a cog, kind of a gear, uh, that's built onto the end of the platen roller that engages the line advance mechanism in here. And once you pull the platen out, um, all those little spring-loaded parts kind of get loose, and the challenge is getting those back in place in the right order so that the line advance works properly and I had to reinstall it several different times to get it properly set. The other thing that you might take note of is there is a little rubber bushing on the right side between the platen roller shaft and this right hand bracket and that bushing one of the things it serves to do is your carriage release lever uh, there, it's like a fork-shaped little lever that pivots as you push the button here and it engages another little plate that actually uh, moves the rack here out of the way of the escapement and if this bushing isn't pressed firmly up against those two plates what happens is the one slips out from the other one and then it, you can't release the carriage and so this is still happening a little bit 
uh, after I reinstalled these and got everything set. So it might be because the rubber bushing has probably shrunk due to age and I'm going to have to probably put some spacer washers on that rubber bushing to make sure those two plates are pressed firmly together and they can stay engaged. Other than that, um, yeah, the machine of course is, you know, built in 1930 but surprisingly not that dirty. I mean there was a lot of dust in it but not really that much eraser crumbs. I really haven't cleaned it up, you know, perfectly good. You might if you looked underneath the back of this machine, you might see some dust and stuff I haven't gotten to, but I've been writing with this thing and it's really cool. Okay, on the right side of the machine, first of all, you have the ribbon reversing uh, lever uh, that moves back and forth. And um, it does, though, have an automatic reversing system. And also, if you turn this knob, it will manually turn the ribbons, uh, real, the ribbon spools. Okay, on the right side of the carriage. so the carriage release lever right here and you can see right now that I have my little problem pushing it and I can't go to the left I have to kind of angle it so that little bushing is not quite pushing those plates together like it should anyways and then this lever here releases the tension on the rollers and by the way when I once I pulled out the platen, I discovered that the rollers, the two rubber rollers underneath, they pull right out. They're just sitting in little, a little, they have little pins on the end of the rubber, and they sit in little grooves, and they just pull right out. So it's super easy to remove and clean them. But uh, there's the tension uh, release lever, paper bale. And then on the back, uh, you have your uh, margin settings. So it's basically push and slide, like most margin settings are on this back scale which does have an indexing mark and it has a nice sounding bell if you can release the carriage that is well I'll have to work on that later <laughs> anyways obviously the problem only shows up when the camera is rolling anyway the uh, decals on the back of the machine are in fairly good condition considering the paint has some scratches on it and I think these two areas of scratches is due to the way that the case attaches these two little metal prongs designed to fit underneath the body of the typewriter and what people probably ended up doing is just kind of scratching it down the back of the machine when they want to put the case on but uh, yeah you know due to the age of it that's kind of ex to be expected so on the left side of the, uh, the carriage here um, you have this lever right here for the line spacing that's single and that's double spacing and that little lever is very similar in appearance to the uh, Corona, the other typewriters of this age and vintage. The carriage return lever is a bit short, but on the other hand, I kind of like the way this spring-loaded little uh, other little secondary lever pops up and it's curved. So it gives you a little nice little finger rest. So yeah, it's relatively short, but it's right just behind the uh, left ribbon spool. So it's not such a bad... Uh, position for it considering it's so short and once you put the case on it just the case just pushes this down and into the storage position which is really nice oh yeah the platen has these two little paper guides on either side that slide back and forth to support the paper I try to keep them as far outboard of the paper that I can because I noticed the left hand guide will sometimes want to get hung up underneath the paper scale here near the vibrator and get stuck. So I try to keep them out toward the edge. Uh, the other thing I noticed about this machine is the segment slots here in the, in the machine. It, that whole segment disc is mounted more vertically uh, than in a lot of machines. A lot of other machines is kind of more horizontal. But this one's sort of more vertical and the type bars are therefore more horizontal. And I don't know if it contributes to this, but the fact of the matter is when I got it, I, before I even did any cleaning on it, I didn't have any problems with any sticking of the keys, of uh, the type bars in the slots of the segment. I haven't had any issues like that. Have not had any issues with the escapement or skipping or anything. So remarkable. And maybe that has something to do with the design of the machine. Maybe it just doesn't have those problems as easily. So I'm pretty impressed with that. Um, getting forward here now on the keyboard this little button right here is your margin release button and it's kind of halfway hidden by the backspace key and you'll notice the backspace 
lever. I haven't quite figured out if it's slightly bent too far to the left, but it does sort of partially hide that margin release button. And I would say if there's any flaw in the design of the typewriter, that's probably it. Just it's not as easy to get to. Uh, the keys. The keys are wonderful. They are the glass topped with brass, or uh, sorry, with nickel rings, and uh, it has the original uh, decals or uh, lettering inserts, and it's really wonderful, uh, nice classic typeface on this machine. One thing I noticed that's interesting about the keyboard layout is the question mark is a shifted comma. I don't know if you the glare on that. Yeah, it's, instead of having the upper and lowercase comma, the question mark is a shifted comma instead of being above the slash. And what's above the slash is a three-quarter fraction. So you have one half, one quarter here, and then you have a three-quarter. So there's an extra fraction there. They move the question mark over a little bit. Other than that, I believe it's a pretty standard typewriter keyboard of this era. Backspacer is here and uh, shift, shift lock. And the alignment of the upper and lower case is really good. Um, I'm gonna have to do here a, uh, a show you an example of the typing, the typing. And then right back here is the ribbon color selector between red, black, and then your center stencil position. So a very nice uh, portable machine and I'm very impressed with the condition of this. Now one thing it did do, and it, that was kind of irritating me was the uh, space bar was making kind of a loud clanking noise and what I did to kind of solve that was that underneath the machine, let me get my screwdriver, there's a bracket here coming off the space bar and I simply put some adhesive craft foam I put some on the top of the bracket so when, this, so when the space bar hits the bracket it dampens it. And then I put some on the bottom of the, this L bracket so that when it hits the bottom of the case, when it's mounted in its base, it doesn't make a wooden clanking noise as you're spacing. So that, I did that kind of to quieten the typewriter and it seems to work pretty good. I don't believe it originally had that kind of uh, uh, padding or muting uh, on that bracket. but. I've done this before with a couple other typewriters and it does seem to help quieten it up when you're typing. Okay, so I still have this intermittent problem with the carriage release lever and so I'm going to pull the platen out. So loosen this set screw on the right, pull out that shaft, and then on the left Get the other set screw lined up and pull it off. Then with the paper bale forward, you kind of angle the right side of the platen up and pull it loose. So it has the ratcheting tooth built on the side of it and then it has your little shaft that you push in and pull out to release the ratcheting like a clutch. And uh, not such a bad condition for the age but it is hard. Okay so let's see here. I don't know if you can see it but there is a rubber bushing right there. I'm going to try to pull that out. And there is this rubber bushing, which acts as a spacer it's supposed to keep those two plates pushed together. And what I'm going to try to do is probably get a washer and install a washer on the end of this and make it a little thicker so it pushes those two plates together a little bit easier. So here you can see when you push the carriage release lever, that little U-shaped arm is not engaged with the, lar the lower darker arm unless you push this back like that. Now, oops, hard to do one-handed, but now it kind of does it like that. Anyways, so I need to make sure that that rubber bushing is pushing this back as far as it'll go. Okay, so to replace this 
worn and now split bushing, I've gone to the uh, automotive parts store and I got some automotive tubing that is very close in size to the bushing. And the trick is now I have to cut the tubing straight and to size. Now you notice the piece of tubing they cut me has a natural kind of a bend in it. And that's kind of a problem. My initial attempt at cutting it just isn't very good with a razor knife. So <clears throat> what I found works pretty good is you take like a brass or metal tube that is roughly the same diameter as the uh, inside diameter of the tubing. It stretches it just a little bit, but it also straightens out the tubing enough to where you can now um, you can take your razor knife and you can rotate this around and cut it to size. And so now I have what I think is a pretty close piece. I'm making it a little bit wider than the original one just because I'm thinking the original one was worn down and if I make it a little bit wider I may not be able to, may not have to use the metal washer as a spacer. So let's go see how this thing fits. Okay, so I've managed to get the bushing back in place down in here. It's a little thick so it's definitely pushing the platen uh, to the left and pushing on those two little lever arms that perform the um, carriage release function. So definitely got my carriage release working again. And then on the left side of the platen the real issue is you want to make sure that the this little spring-loaded arm here stays engaged uh, back in here. You don't want it to pop off because then it's going to jam the uh, the ratchet from moving. So I have my ratcheting, my platen turns, and my carriage uh, release lever line advance works. So, well, that was fun, huh? Fixing the typewriter in the middle of the typewriter video. <laughs> Well, hey, there it is. So the line spacing works still, and now my carriage return works. So I put that extra thick rubber bushing in made from a piece of automotive hose, vacuum hose. So there you go. Um, I did not need to use the little washer, by the way, because I, I cut the new piece so wide enough. So um, one of the things I was going to talk about on this machine are the ribbon spools. Now, I keep comparing this machine to my Corona 4, and the reason why is the Corona 4 that I had was the only other uh, typewriter that has been in my collection that was of the same rough vintage as this. It was like late 1920s. This is 1930. And so there's a natural tendency to want to compare the two. One of the other nagging things that I didn't like about the Corona 4, besides the fact that my particular sample had vertical misalignment of all the type slugs, was that it's a common problem on those machines that the clearance between the ribbon spools and the ribbon cover was really tight and it might have been that the original ribbon spools intended for that machine might have been a little bit smaller in diameter than the kind of universal replacement spool that we get today. And so I talked about this with John Lewis, the uh, typewriter repairman here in Albuquerque, and he agreed with me that almost all the Corona 4s he's seen have a problem with the reliability of the ribbon advancing if you have the uh, covers on and so I always had to take at least one of the ribbon covers off when I was typing in order for them to move otherwise they would bind up and then you end up with a dead spot in the ribbon. Uh, on the other hand in comparison this typewriter does not have that problem. These ribbon spools are designed well enough to have plenty of clearance between the uh, inside surface of the cover and the spool. So never any problem with that. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed this, um, but um, there's an interesting little decoration that's cut into the ribbon spool, which is basically UT. Now this isn't the Texas Longhorns. <laughs> it's not the University of Texas Hook'em Horns or whatever. This, what is it, like that or like that? Anyway, probably like that. No, this is Underwood Typewriter. UT. I just thought it was a cool little little detail that you might not have noticed. But uh, so yeah, I like this uh, typewriter for that reason. It seems to be built a little bit better than the Coronas, and little features like the uh, ribbon covers are uh, big enough to be practical. They don't bind up the ribbon. Uh, another thing I was going to mention here before I close was 
almost all the mechanical parts down here have some kind of an interesting black finish on them. I don't know if it's anodization uh, or powder coating or something, but they're all this black finish. And I think it gives a really high quality look to the machine. And I think um, it looks to me like it contributes to those parts not uh, wearing and not getting as gunked up with grease as they otherwise might be. But I was just thinking in terms of the amount of labor and cost that went into uh, coating all those parts um, instead of just leaving them as bare metal. So that's an interesting observation. Back in the 1920s when this uh, typewriter was made, there was a different ethic around manufacturing. Uh, it was probably the heyday of the Industrial Revolution. Okay, well, let's do a little bit of test typing, shall we? Uh, quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Pack my box with five dozen liquor jugs. And it's a very nice looking typeface. It has a really good alignment to it. Uh, so for instance, uh, oops, <laughs> let's try that again. So one of the other things I like about this machine is the, uh, the outer case, the top case, the handle is a little bit worn. I don't really trust it carrying it uh, by the handle, but the, I really love this brass plate on the front where the latch is. Really nice. The case is in really good shape. And there is a dealer sticker in here. Typewriters, adding machine, sales, supplies, repairs, Lakewood Office Machine Company, 15607 Madison Avenue. I haven't really looked and seen what city this is. It's certainly not Albuquerque, but uh, sold somewhere else in the United States. Um, overall, my impression of this machine is I'm very impressed with the quality of it, and this really is a workable machine. Considering it was built in 1930, this is a writer's machine. A little bit uh, worn and rusted, but um, uh, I can live with that, and uh, I think it had probably a great history. I don't know who owned it, but uh, a lovely machine. This is one of those that you definitely want to have in your collection, an older Underwood portable machine if it's in good shape like this one is. Well, until next time, this is Joe Van Cleve, and you guys have yourselves a great day.